Tomasz Tepienga. Uh, I work for Parity Technologies, and um, this will be more technical talk than we used to have here, um, but I hope it will be okay. Of course, it's not possible to cover the whole Ethereum uh, in, in a single talk, so I will be focusing more on Ethereum transactions and uh, why do they look like they look, uh, how they are encoded in blockchain, and also uh, the subtitle is uh, Towards Metropolis, and um, uh, I will talk a little bit more about it later. So it's a, it's a new release of Ethereum, and there will be a lot of changes, uh, especially concerning transactions. Mm. Okay, uh, so we all know what Ethereum is. Um, it's a distributed network, it's a, it's, it's a blockchain, but it's a special kind of blockchain where uh, on a blocks we have a, a state of a virtual machine. And with each block, this virtual machine is doing some computations and the state is changing. Uh, this slide and the next slide is from Dan Finlay's intro to how Ethereum works. I really recommend this video. It's uh, only 10 minutes long but it's, it's really great introduction. Um, okay, so this is what, what is uh, in, in the single block of Ethereum. So we have a timestamp, uh, a lot of hashes, and there is this one thing that is very important and I will be focusing on today. It's a list of transactions. So transactions are the way to interact with this uh, virtual machine. Um, which is Ethereum. Okay, so where do the transactions come from? So how do they end up in a block? Um, of course we know that Ethereum is a, a distributed network, the centralized network, and we know that if we want to include something in a block, we need to propagate it, we need to broadcast it to other peers in the network, and uh, some of the peers will relay these transactions and there are also special kind of peers that are able to issue new blocks and they are putting our transactions into the blocks, okay? But the trick is that uh, they are not really putting those transactions to the block, but they are deciding to put them. So there are some heuristics which transactions should go to the block and which should, should don't. Also miners can, can really choose whatever transactions they want to include um, in a blockchain. And um, I will be talking more about uh, what are the miners' strategy to do that. Okay, so first I will focus on what does the transaction look like, what fields do we need in a transaction, uh, how the node decides to propag propagate the transaction, and how the miner decides to um, include the transaction in a block. And the very last thing will be, what are the changes in Metropolis release? Okay, so what do we need in a transaction? Of course, the most obvious things, like uh, a sender, a recipient, and a value. And uh, uh, yeah, sort of. <laughs> so the sender is not really a part of that transaction. Uh, because we can recover the sender from the signature. Uh, signature is those three elements, VRS at the, at the end. Mm, so it's, it's not really, it's in the signature, but it's not uh, explicitly part of the transaction. Uh, we have a recipient, yes, but only if it's not a contract deployment, because if, if we want to deploy a new contract in Ethereum, uh, then we don't need a recipient. Uh, value. We have value, yes, that's um, a mandatory parameter of a transaction, but it won't be mandatory in the future. Um, it will change. Um, also, Ethereum is this global computer, so you can do a lot of computations on it, but you need to pay for this computation, and we have a metric to uh, figure out how expensive your computation is, and that metric is called gas, and the uh, transaction contains two parameters um, that deal with gas somehow. One is uh, gas limit. Uh, it tells uh, the miner how, uh, what is the upper bound 
of the execution cost of this transaction. Um, the second one is a gas price. So how much is a sender willing to pay for each unit of, of gas, so for, for each unit of computation? And uh, if you multiply gas price and gas, you will get the fee that will be paid to a miner uh, for executing this transaction. Uh, yes, it's a maximum fee. Um, of course, we need some kind of data, and uh, that, together with gas, is, uh, are the only mandatory parameters in the transactions. Uh, it, it will be only mandatory parameters in the transaction in future, and uh, b data is just uh, any bytes. It's usually FABI encoded, um, and it's, it contains all the data that can be read by the contract. So, so it's like an input for the, for the program that we are executing on the Ethereum blockchain. And we need uh, nonce, um, which we often forget about, but it's, it's kind of important um, because uh, the nonce defines the order of the transactions. So imagine that I want to send two transactions and I want them to be executed in order and they will be ex executed in order because of the nonce. Um, also, if I send one transaction, for instance, transferring five ether to Marek, uh, he would be able to uh, send my transaction again in the future to do the same thing because the transaction would be perfectly valid and he will be able to drain my account from, from all the funds that I have. And uh, nonce is protecting me from, from Marek doing that. So each transaction can be used only once because the nonce, uh, it's actually incremental number um, uh, as a part of the transaction. Uh, and the transaction that is executed right, it can be executed right now, needs to have a nonce that is greater than the amount of transaction executed before. And that's the last point. Yeah. And uh, of course, nonce is stored on the blockchain. It's part of the account state. So in total, this is what the transaction looks like. Uh, we have a nonce, gas price, gas, uh, optional recipient, um, value data, and a signature with VRS. And uh, the transactions that are being broadcasted between peers they actually look like this, but they are RLP encoded. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a format uh, that is used by Ethereum almost everywhere. Uh, it's, um, it's an acronym for recursive length prefix. And um, yeah, this is, this is what transactions look like. Okay, so now how the miners uh, or regular nodes uh, decide what transactions are actually worth to be propagated to other peers. And uh, for miners, what transactions should they mine? Mm, of course, a rational miner will try to maximize uh, his earnings. So he will look, okay, uh, I, can, I can mint uh, empty blocks, uh, but there are also some transactions floating in the network. And if I include them, I can actually make some more money from it. So that's a, that's a rational decision, I would say. Um, okay, so a miner may, may think, oh, so I need to keep a queue of all the transactions that I saw in the network, and I will just order them by a fee that I will get, and the ones that will pay me the most, they will be the ones that I will include first. Because the blocks in Ethereum uh, are um, th there is a gas limit in a block, and you cannot execute more transactions uh, than the current gas limit. Uh, it's because the whole network needs to process all the blocks that are happening. So if you have, even if you have like a supercomputer and you could process much more blocks in 14 seconds, there might be some peers that will struggle to process those um, <coughs> those. Um, those smaller blocks, and uh, we want the whole network to keep, keep up. This is why the, the gas limit is um, in a block, and uh, yeah, okay. So the miner will be ordering the transactions by the fee, 
but it's not enough. Um, oh, okay, so yeah, that will be on the next slide. But first, um, the problem is that even though uh, I will get some money from including the transaction, uh, actually the chance that I will uh, mine an uncle uh, is increasing. And an uncle is a block that doesn't get, go to the canonical chain, uh, so I don't get a full reward from it, but is included in a block anyway to kind of um, to cater for that uh, increased time of execution. And there is an equilibrium, so the equilibrium says how many transactions you should include or what should be the minimal fee uh, to include the transac transaction for you to, to actually maximize your earnings and not um, lose money. Uh, okay, if you have any questions, please raise your hands uh, when I speak. Um, I will try to answer them. Uh, also, there will be some time for Q&A after the, the talk. Mm, okay, so I, I've mentioned about nonce, and um, just ordering by a fee is not enough, because nonce says that we need to include some transactions uh, after the other transactions. So Actually, what miners are doing, they, they are keeping a queue, but the queue is ordered first but the, by something that we call nonce height. So it's a relative um, nonce. For instance, um, the first transaction that you can see, it has nonce zero. So it's obviously the first transaction that uh, sender number one uh, has ever sent. But uh, sender number two has already sent 100 transactions. And the next transaction that will be included for him uh, is a transaction with a nonce of, of 100. And uh, so both of those transactions have height zero. So it means that they are valid to be included in the next block. Um, then we have transactions with uh, nonce height one. And uh, within those slots, we order transactions by a fee. Um, Oh, okay, so there is actually a mistake here because transaction number two should be um, above transaction number four. Um, so that's, that's what uh, miners queue look like. Mm, but there is also a problem because uh, transactions in the network, they might be received by the peers out of order. So we sometimes may get a transaction with a nonce that is much higher than the nonce that we uh, that we see that currently should be included. Mm, so, what should we do with such tr transactions? We could discard them completely, but the problem is that uh, the um, uh, peers might not propagate the transaction again for us. So we cannot just discard it because then it means that we will be uh, we we won't be maximizing our profits. So we need to store the transaction for some time. And uh, that's what, why we have in, the, in every uh, Ethereum client, there are, there are two separate queues, and one of them is called current queue, or like ready to be included queue, and the other one is called future. And uh, it contains all the transactions that we have seen in the network, but they doesn't really seem to be valid yet. But we anticipate that there are some transactions missing that we will get in the future uh, and will make those transactions valid. Um, of course, um, it sounds kind of easy, but every, uh, every complication that we are making in this scheme is actually just uh, widening the attack surface for the miners. Because imagine if the future queue is not limited in any way, or we never remove any information from the future queue. So what will happen is that I can send a lot of transactions to this miner, and eventually he will run out of memory, because those transactions will never be executed, because I won't send this transaction with, with correct nonce. So we need to be very careful how, um, how those Thing, how many things we can store and how we store those things to, to be sure that there are no additional attacks um, against the miners. 
Um, okay, so we know that there is a fee, and fee is gas price times gas, but what if someone sets gas price to zero? Is it a valid transaction? Actually, it is a valid transaction, and uh, some miners may decide to include such transaction in a blockchain, but the, um, the problem is that someone can execute some code on a blockchain, but he won't pay anything for it. And um, maybe it doesn't make sense, but it's, it's really important for uh, Ethereum adoption, because every new Ethereum user, uh, when they first um, encounter the technology, they can create their account easily, but they don't have any funds. Uh, they need to convert some, some fiat to, to Ether before they can start doing anything. So there, there, there is a lot of discussions happening. How can we enable those new users to, to adopt the technology without paying this upfront cost? Mm. So yeah, there are some ideas, for instance, whitelisting some contracts. So the contracts that can, uh, wh when you send a transaction to them, they can send back some, some ether for you. Um, yeah. or, or maybe maybe if there are no transactions in the network, then the miners can decide to include those transactions anyway to, you know, to keep the network going, to, to see some stuff happening. So if the blocks are empty, we don't see many transactions floating around, maybe we should include those transactions anyway. Um, Okay, uh, actually the, the, the correct answer, what to do with this, is that uh, all of the clients, so all of the major clients, or all of the clients that I know about, uh, like Parity and Geth, uh, they have a minimal gas price, so it's, a, it's just a minimal gas price that the transaction needs to have uh, to be accepted by the, by the miner to, to be included in the block. Um, okay, so, we got, the tr we got the transaction, we put it to the queue, but we also need to validate the correctness of the transaction, and there are a couple of things that we need to uh, do. So one is uh, to check the, if the signature is correct, uh, and also recover the sender from the signature. Um, check the network ID. So there, is, um, there was a problem when, when Ethereum Classic came along that those two networks were uh, were split. It, it wasn't the same blockchain, it was like a different version of reality, but the transactions that were sent on one blockchain could be easily replayed on the other blockchain. So for instance, someone could, could, told, could, could tell you, oh, could you transfer your Ethereum Classic to my account? Um, I, I will pay you in dollars in using, I don't know, PayPal or something. You transfer your Ethereum Classic to him and he was replaying the same transaction on Ethereum uh, main network, and it transferred uh, your Ethers to him as well. Um, so there was an EIP-155, I believe, that introduced uh, replay protection, and um, currently all the transactions that are sent in Ethereum network, they contain additional parameter called chain ID, it's, it's not a separate par parameter. We have reused one of the uh, signature fields, and uh, we also check the replay protection to, to be sure that the transaction is actually valid on this blockchain. Um, of course, the declared gas cannot exceed the current block gas, block gas limit, and uh, also this gas price needs to be greater than the minimal gas price. Um, okay, so another problem is, what if the transaction, we, okay, we, we have them in the queue, we are now starting to execute them to include them into the new block, and what if one of the transactions goes out of gas? Um, okay, so it, it wasn't valid, the, everything that the transaction changed in the, in the Ethereum state was actually reverted, but we still need to include it in the blockchain. Because uh, there is this fundamental problem in computer science called, called uh, halting problem. So we cannot figure out if the transaction is valid, if the execution will fail or not. 
uh, upfront, we actually need to execute the transaction to, to know that. And um, if we would discard transactions like this, uh, you could DDoS the miners. So they will be executing those transactions. They will be wasting a lot of time doing so, uh, but none of them will be included in the blockchain. So even if the transaction goes out of, ga out of gas, it's still included in the blockchain. Okay. <clears throat> Um, we also need to check if the user has enough balance, but it's, it's kind of tricky. So imagine that user A has just five ether, and he tries to send this uh, five ether to B and to C uh, in a two separate transactions. Um, it might seem obvious that after sending this first transaction, he will have zero ether, and the second transaction is not valid, but it's not uh, it's, it's not always true, because actually calling B might be some contract execution, and the contract may, may pay back uh, some money, so he, will, he may end up with 10 ether, actually. Um, also, there might be other transactions in the network that will increase the balance of, of this user, so we cannot discard those transactions that easily. Mm. Okay. The... Another issue or another question arises when, when you see in the network transactions that, ha that kind of look the same, so they have the same sender, the same nonce, uh, but they are different transactions. And miners and also nodes that propagates the transactions, they need to decide which one uh, is the valid one. Okay, so both are, are valid, but only one can be included in a blockchain, so which one should be? Um, of course, we can say we want to maximize our earnings, so let's include the one with, uh, with maximal fee, but what, what if the fee is the same, but the parameters are different? So for instance, what uh, Parity is doing in such case, um, it's taking the transaction with, with greater gas price. So it doesn't matter what the fee is, but uh, we, just, we just see that gas price is greater, so we will choose that one. And it has some consequences that I will show on, a, on another slide. Um, okay, and um, yeah, so these are these consequences because if, if we once send a transaction uh, in a network, it cannot be canceled. It will be there forever. And uh, sometimes there are transactions that are floating in the network and cannot, ca can never be executed. Uh, for instance, those future transactions that miners uh, keep around. Um, sometimes the transaction might be valid in a particular point of time, but after the block gas limit is, um, uh, is lowered, those transactions are not valid anymore, and they will be floating in the network. Hopefully they, they won't, because the, all the nodes should update the queues and uh, refu reject the transactions that are um, above current block gas, um, but they might be occupying the queue for some time. Also, the gas price might be too little, so uh, it might be propagated by other nodes, but all the miners will decide to increase the, the minimal gas price, and they won't include that. They, they will never include the transaction. Um, so sometimes we need to somehow like cancel the transaction, so we don't want to do it anymore. The other, the other use case is uh, ICOs. So there is a cap or a, or a time limit, and uh, people, are, people are sending a lot of transactions uh, with uh, high gas usage uh, because they want to you know, buy in the ICO. But after the cap is reached, all the transactions will, will go out of gas. So they will p pay for the fee, but they will get nothing from it. Um, so they are also interested in how to how they can cancel all the transactions that are not valid anymore. Uh, there is one proposal um, um, created recently uh, to include um, a block number until uh, which this transaction is valid. And after some block number, all the transactions will be invalidated. And um, I'm not sure if this will get to Metropolis release, but maybe it will be implemented in some time in the future. Um, but the, 
like, like the thing that you might try to do to save, um, save all the fees that you would pay otherwise is to send a transaction which doesn't do anything. So it's from you to you, uh, transfers zero, zero value, uh, has only 21K gas. It's a minimal gas that, that the transaction needs to have. And the gas price needs to be just slightly greater than the, than the current gas price. Uh, sorry, than the gas price that the previous transaction had. Mm, okay, so these are some parameters that uh, you can use in parity to control um, what, how your node behaves regarding to all those uh, transactions and uh, propagating and mining. Uh, of course, miners usually know this stuff, but we also need ordinary nodes to propagate the transactions, and usually they just run on default settings. Uh, but if you want to tune them, you can, you can use some parity CLIs. And uh, one of them is relay set. Uh, there are two settings. Um, the default one is cheap, and it means that we will be propagating the transactions but we will never execute them. So we just validate this basic stuff, but we don't really try to include this transaction in a blockchain, and we still propagate those transactions to other peers. Um, so we don't do much computation, but from the network perspective, um, we might be propagating invalid transactions. And the second option is to actually run each transaction that you see in the network and uh, avoid propagating it uh, if, it's, if it's not really valid. Mm. Parity also uses uh, current Ether to US dollar price as, um, as a base for minimal gas price. So there is a setting that says that uh, the basic transaction, so just the value transfer, uh, it needs to generate like uh, 25,000 uh, US dollar profit for the miner. And uh, Parity is checking what's the current USD if um, gas, gas, uh, sorry, um, if USD uh, conversion rate, and based on that is uh, setting your minimal gas price. Uh, there is also transaction gas limit, so you can refuse all the transactions that are above some gas limit. Uh, that was introduced during the, um, the state bloating attack and uh, some earlier attacks last year. Mm. We also have refused service transactions. So those are the transactions that have zero gas price, uh, but they use like a on-chain whitelist of uh, contracts that um, those transactions co can call. Okay, now to Metropolis. Mm. Metropolis will be a third major release of Ethereum. So it will be the third major plant hard fork. Um, there was a Frontier network launched in July 2015. It was called Ethereum 1.0, uh, a Homestead release uh, last year. And um, in the second quarter of 2017, uh, we hope to release Metropolis. It will be Ethereum 1.2. And um, there are quite a lot of changes, so it, it's supposed to be uh, a release that will um, raise the adoption um, significantly. Uh, Serenity will be the release that will be completely usable by, by um, ordinary people, not technical people, but Metropolis is, um, is a one step in that direction. Um, so that's... Uh, I think it's not exhaustive list of all the changes that um, we'll make to Metropolis. And I'm gonna focus on the first one because it, it, it's um, related to transactions um, mostly. Um, so Metropolis will introduce a new kind of transactions that will be floating in the network. And those, those transactions will just have four fields. It will be gas, uh, optional recipient, data, and network ID. Nothing else. No signature, no uh, gas price, no nonce. And um, the idea is that um, 
instead of encoding all the stuff that I was talking about in a protocol itself, we can put it on the blockchain. And uh, instead of uh, using just uh, ECDSA to, uh, for signatures, we can implement any um, signature schemes on a blockchain in a contract, and the contract can verify the signature er and actually pay for, the, for its execution. So that's the, that's the consequences uh, of uh, changes in Metropolis. Um, first, the accounts can be uh, abstracted to contract. Um, so the contracts will be able to pay for themselves. The transactions will be like those zero gas price transactions that I mentioned earlier. Um, we can do any replay protection. It doesn't have to be nonce, so it doesn't have to be incremental. Uh, think you can send like free transactions and you can say those transactions will can be included in a blockchain in any order because I don't care um, You can use any signature uh, It doesn't need to be ECDSA. There is also one additional change in Metropolis that will make it much easier and much cheaper and it's um, um, Big int uh, built-in contract that allows to do very efficient and also cost efficient uh, operations on uh, big number, big numbers. Um, Ether is becoming just a token. So in principle, miners could be paid in any token they want. So there might be miners that only include like uh, transactions that pay them in, in some particular token. Um, the challenges are that current miner strategy doesn't really work. Actually, it doesn't work at all because we don't have any of those things that are crucial to maintain this this queue of transactions in the network. And uh, there are some ideas how to how to solve that. Um, so initially, uh, most probably there will be only some contracts that are allowed to receive the zero gas price transactions. So the ones in introduced in Metropolis. Um, and it will be hard coded in the clients. Perhaps we can move to like on chain whitelist in the future. And uh, also, miners will need to know that the transactions, they actually contain some data in them. So we will be going into the data field, taking out the signature that is actually there, and verifying the signature uh, to maintain the valid queue. OK. Uh, you could say that, yeah, we can go into the details, but maybe it will be more, it, it would be easier to just run the transaction. Uh, for instance, uh, do some, I don't know, like 100 steps in a contract. And then if within those 100 steps, if the miner is being paid for executing this transaction, then, okay, let's pr proceed with it. Let's include it in the, in the, in the queue. Uh, but the problem is that 100 first instruction might be a revert instruction, so it will revert all the changes, so it won't pay the miner at all. And um, basically, you would need to execute the whole transaction to actually know if it, uh, if it pays you or, or not. And this is what this like relay set strict is about. But uh, it's, it's not really a reliable, reliable strategy for, um, for instance, light clients running on a, on a mobile device. Oh, okay. Uh, so that's a list of references. Um, I will share the slide later. Uh, like the, the most important ones are those uh, abstraction EIP and the transaction format EIP. There is this uh, dance intro to how Ethereum works uh, video that I really recommend. Mm, and some other links to, to read. And that's basically it. So. Are there any questions? Do we have time for questions? Uh, we have the microphone here, so this, this cube is the microphone, so I can throw it to anyone who wants to ask the question. <laughs> No, 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 the other. Okay. Okay. Um, so if you have a gas price of zero, uh, is that uh, a risk? In, what if somebody wants to uh, do a denial of service attack? 
whole, put a whole bunch of transactions. It would take computational power, but uh, how do you prevent that? Um, okay, so so gas is not only a metric for computational power. That's that's like the, the easiest one, but I actually forgot to mention that it's a, it's a joint metric for uh, computational power, memory, and uh, I.O. And actually, I.O. being the most um, underpriced or maybe the most difficult to price correctly. And this is what we've seen with the uh, state bloat attack um, last year. And um, yeah, so the problem with zero gas, transaction, zero gas price transactions is that um, like you need to pay for, for the execution time on all those computers. And uh, for instance, computers with HDD drives, uh, if you do a lot of I.O. operations, they will take 10 times or 100 times more uh, to execute some transactions than the, 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 the nodes with SSD drives, for instance. And to prevent that, uh, that's, that's part of the miner strategy. Because um, at the end, it's the miners uh, who, um, who are the, more, the, the ones that are the most affected by this. Because if the transaction is really executing for a very long time for them, they will lose an, a lot of money because they will, the, like the, the, the chance of mining the uncle is increasing. Um, and the initial idea is that we can use some whitelisted contracts. So you won't be able to do everything with the zero gas price transactions. But if the transaction is going to this uh, account contract that uh, the co I, I showed the code uh, on the screen, and this account contract is actually, uh, it, it will be the same for, for everyone. It will check the signature. It will um, pay the miner for, uh, for the execution. And then it will execute the transaction. And for instance, at the beginning, only those contracts will be whitelisted. Does it answer the question? Um, any other questions? There's one over there. Just before I hand it over, uh, you talked a little about miners and the strategy. Mm -hmm. And what do we know about miners in Ethereum network? Uh, like, I'm not very much into Ethereum. Okay. That's why I'm here also to learn about this. I know a little bit more about Bitcoin blockchain. And is there also a you know good understanding of of the Bitcoin? Sorry, Ethereum and mining community where they are, you know, located. Uh, are they working in like pools? Um, can you just throw some more light into this? You know. Um, yeah. So, so there are mining pools uh, like in Bitcoin. Uh, I don't know much <laughs> about it. Uh, I'm not really. So we have uh, some people in um, in our company that are uh, in contact with some miners. Uh, but uh, I, I'm not really one of them. But from what I know, they are really following closely what's happening in the community. Uh, they, they have some contact points in, um, in, in foundation and also GAF team and uh, parity team. We also get some um, uh, issues from them, some feature requests. Uh, for instance, parity has a Stratum proxy. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, Stratum protocol proxy built in. Uh, so you, need, you don't need to pull for work, but Parity can push work to, to your miner. And um, yeah, that's, that's everything I know. <laughs> so. OK, so uh, I have two questions. First yep. question is, uh, when you're a miner, uh, you technically you can get a block reward, mm -hmm. just a, like the ETH, uh, ether inflation. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then also you get a reward from the gas prices on the transactions, right? So uh, why do you have this duality? Uh, wouldn't it be better, or just out of curiosity, if you would only get um, the financial incentive from the gas transactions rather than having this additional inflation? Mm -hmm. And the, the second, do you want to answer that? And I'll go with my second question, maybe, yeah. OK, so um, I, I think that's rather a question for like the big brains that are working on the economic incentives <laughs> of Ethereum network. Um, I think they want to keep the inflationary model. Um, I'm not an economist or like game theorist, so so cannot really um, you know, elaborate why is that happening. But, uh. Fair enough. <laughs> and the the second question is, okay, so if I write a, a, a contract um, and uh, it gets assigned to a certain block number, then we have new blocks and so on, 
And then if there's some kind of recursive action in the contract, like I want to check something or uh, make a transaction when we get to block number X or whatever. So um, how does the computer compute that block that was back several um, units ago? Like, so call the contract or is it like self-aware <laughs> in a way? Okay, so, so, there are, so when you put something on a blockchain, it creates a contract with some, um, some external interface, so some, fu some functions that you can call. Um, but the contract cannot like, schedule its own execution in the future. Mm -hmm. You rather need to send another transaction that will use one of those functions and will kind of you know, pull this contract for some work. Uh, there are uh, centralized services that do that for you. Mm -hmm. So you can send a transaction to some contract then there is a centralized service that's, uh, that sees, okay, it means that you want to reschedule us polling you in, um, I don't know, in one hour or something, okay. and they will Ping send it. this transaction yeah. and pay for, for the execution. Super. Yeah. Oh, there is one more. Uh, so from my, from my understanding, uh, Ethereum is based on uh, proof of work, right? Yes. And I heard a rumor that uh, it's going to be a proof of stake soon. Uh, yes. <laughs> Can you say something about what? it? What? Um, How soon? So I think Vitalik tweeted that it's like 85% ready or something, right? The work on Casper. Casper is the, the protocol uh, for proof of stake. Uh, there are some rumors that it will be proof of stake plus proof of work at the beginning. Uh, to secure the network, but we don't really have any uh, publicly available test nets running on proof of stake yet. Um, and um, I think it won't happen in the next quarter or maybe not even in the next half a year. Uh, maybe end of 2017, maybe 2018, I don't know. 2018. So that's probably when. Oh, so um, proof of work is uh, you need to burn real money and electricity to mint, a new, mint new blocks. So you need to do all this like crazy stuff with GPUs, uh, build this, uh, this farms of servers that will compute um, this uh, block seals. Uh, proof of stake is called virtual mining. So instead of uh, burning the money, uh, you uh, lock the money in the contract. So you cannot use it for like a very long period. And this allows you to uh, create new blocks. In, um, y you are becoming a validator. Uh, it's not really defined yet how many validators will be in the network. But then every validator can sign on a block and uh, make it valid. So th there is no like, you know, um, ecological waste produced with proof of stake. And also, there are some other properties. No, no, no. So it's completely different protocol. You, uh, oh, sorry, you mean, you mean computation for what happens on the blockchain? Yes, that's correct. But you don't need to do this uh, much more expensive computation that is required to seal the block. So to find a, a, a nonce that will you know, together with a block, will end up with, with some hash uh, based on difficulty. Uh, there are also some properties that you get uh, with proof of stake. Uh, so one of them is um, something that they call uh, economical finality. So with proof of work, theoretically, there, is, there might always be a longer chain uh, that, that is hidden from you. So someone is, is mining like a very long chain and uh, he can publish it, and then all the transactions that happened are reverted. Uh, it's, of course, it's very unlikely, uh, but, with, um, but, but, but there are like, no consequences if, uh, if such thing ha happens. In proof of stake, there is uh, this economic finality, and it means that if such situation happens, then someone, all the validators that have signed the, the other chain, they will lose a lot of money. On that, so it's not only very unlikely, but it's very, um, it's uh, no one is really incentivized to to do to do so. Yeah. 
Um, so I think initially uh, proof of stake was supposed to be part of Metropolis, uh, but um, they needed to do much more research on that. So the idea is that Metropolis will be released with uh, without proof of stake, and uh, proof of stake will make it for Serenity for sure. Uh, but I think it's not decided if it will be another release in the middle or or it will be just Serenity. It was mentioned that about 85% of the, I guess, the stuff that makes the proof of stake work is figured out. So what is the 15% that remains to be figured out? What's the 15%? Yeah. That's... Uh, is still unknown and because of that uh, disables us to mm, enjoy the fruit of proof of stake. Um, I don't know, I'm not working on, on uh, Casper uh, and there is, I'm sure that there are, so uh, there are very bright guys working on it and if they say that they need some more time, I, I, I kind of trust them. <laughs> believe that it's required, and I, I don't know the details, sorry. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, thank you. You can ask some more questions uh, after that. <laughs>